Well, welcome everybody to the 10th Novak Eclipse SIG meeting. Uh, this one was scheduled a little bit late notice. I appreciate people for joining in. The idea this time was to uh, get people, while impressions of the angular eclipse are still fresh in their minds, and uh, but uh, after a while, so the people had a chance to to collect their images, and we'll just go around and primarily go through the images that people submitted. Uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen, if I can. Let's see. All right, so. That's it. Now we can go to slide two. <laughs> Topics for today. <laughs> okay. A um, couple of announcements. I'm going to spend most of the time on on member on uh, member reports that people have sent in. Uh, in a couple of cases, people are going to be sharing from their screens. Hopefully, they're better at this than I am. Um, and just a reminder that um, the files, these slides, uh, some other images will be at that uh, bit.ly slash TSE Total Solar Eclipse 2024, which is our Google Drive share folder uh, under meeting number 10 with today's dates. And there's also the discussion forum at uh, Groups.io. Um, this is the same that's been sent out before. Uh, one thing I want to mention is the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. Uh, has let us know that they'll be running a free eclipse series. And these are the speakers uh, on the slide who will be presenting. I think they have about one session a month. It starts November 3rd. It's free. You go to the Kalamazoo uh, Astronomical Society's website and you register with them. It looks like it'll be a very good series from some top people in the um, in the eclipse following business. Uh, including some uh, Brunyes and Hubier are the people who write the uh, camera control software. Um, Mike Zeiler and Jay Anderson uh, run some of the major websites that people use as references. Fred Espinak, of course, has written books and has websites. Uh, Alan Dyer has written a book. Um, Everything you need about uh, is an astronomer and artist who does uh, eclipse art. He's come up with a series primarily for the National Park Service of uh, posters of about seeing eclipses from the national parks. Uh, but I heard him speak at a previous conference, and he's very good, and he's a good artist. So I recommend that to your attention. Uh, I'm not going to show this. I've got a um, uh, Noah put out. At this website, <clears throat> again, it'll these slides will be on the on the drive Google Drive, mm -hmm. uh, but they have an animation that shows the um, uh, the eclipse from earlier this month and the shadow path across North America, Central America, and South America, and you could literally see the shadow uh, moving across from s apparent sunrise in the Pacific Northwest to sunset off the coast of Africa uh, as tracked from goes west and goes east. And you can see how the brightness on the surface of the earth is uh, is attenuated by the shadow of the moon. Uh, it takes only about three or five minutes, but we're behind enough now. I'll skip that. So we'll go into the, uh, well, it started. So we'll go into the members reports. Um, this is, uh, I have actually one more name in the list that will we'll go through, and I have them primarily in alphabetical order. Uh, I have most of the slides, so I'll be showing those. And what, a, uh, what I hope people will report to everybody else is sort of what they discovered uniquely about their location or their setup and things they learned. Um, it may get a little boring because a lot of people have pictures of uh, partial phases, and, and uh, the annular phase, too. Uh, there are some differences, and I've highlighted some of the slides that people sent me, some of the images that people sent me. So we'll go right into that. If Bill, if you want to start, um, I, I hope you, uh, you saw what I had sent out as a draft earlier, I guess, this morning uh, 
about what I had pulled together from your images. So, Bill. Uh, if, okay, there we are. Yeah, if uh, you unmute. Yeah. So this is the first type eclipse I've gone to where we didn't know where we were going to observe it till about ten minutes before the start of the eclipse. We knew we were in the path, and we were in Farmington, New Mexico. And I had another place lined up just down the road, and but we went to Farmington to get some coffee, and I thought, well, this this looks good. Let's try here. And the the barista suggested one place, but it was to the north, which meant shorter times. I didn't like that, so we said, isn't there another park, you know, south? And oh yeah, go down to Boyd Park. It's right on the Rio Grande River, and. Uh, Wait a minute, it's not the Rio Grande. I have the I have the river wrong. I'm blanking out on what it is. Anyways, it was right on the river, and they were setting up for another event entirely uh, that started, I think, at 11. And I don't know what it was, some high school band thing. But there were plenty of people milling around, and the, the lady kind of running the event, I said, can I share your table? And I had, I have my, uh, this is an 80 millimeter um, spotting scope that I bought used earlier this year, year. And I, it's primarily for birding, but uh, it's got good optics. And I'm now blanking out on the company that makes it, but they make brand and eyepieces. Well, I thought, geez, a spotting scope you know, made by the people who make brand and eyepieces can't be that bad. And the previous owner actually kind of tricked it into a uh, astronomy scope with a right angle uh, mirror there. So I just added my eyepieces. And then we just, you know, watched it through the thing. And I took these pictures are all just handheld iPhone uh, through the eyepiece. And, you know, there's a lot of glare and so on. Uh, so, you know, nothing, nothing professional about about that. And we shared it with some other people. And I ran into a geology colleague there who from Denver who happened to pick the same park. So that was that was very pleasant. Um, as you know, as you might expect, the light turned kind of a brownish color. And the temperature really dropped. It felt like it went into the 30s, but it probably was the, the 40s. It was totally clear day. And, you know, unlike a total, there is no dramatic transition to annularity. I mean, you have to be looking through the scope to even know that it's happened. Although the other thing that you can monitor, and in fact, I think this was my favorite part of the whole eclipse was the pinhole projections so i don't know if you have those in the thing but but looking at the crescents and then the full circles you know project there we go thank you alan so you know the one on the right you don't see that during totality so that's one of the few phenomena that an annular will give you that a total eclipse will not so i i thought that was really cool it, it was sublime. It was kind of more like a lunar eclipse, you know, uh, in that sense. You weren't freaking out and screaming and all that stuff that you do during totality. But it, it was a very pleasant experience. I've seen one. I don't think I need to travel great distances to go see another one, but I'm glad I'm glad I saw one. Yeah, I thought you uh, you had the, the best pictures that I saw of the. Uh of the natural pinhole projection through the tree uh, is very, very uh, interesting and probably amused the the, lo the people who just didn't know what to expect. Well, a lot of them, I should have brought people over. I'm not sure how many were paying attention because they were doing this other thing, but uh, you know, they all had their, they did of course all have their sunglass, their eclipse glasses on. So, you know, but, Anyways, it was it was fun. Okay, thanks, Bill. Uh, we'll go on to uh, uh, Jeff Cook. Hi. 
Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, super. And I put well, all I, your pictures together on this one slide. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. My wife and I went to the town of Torrey, Utah, which was on the center line. And I had uh, about four minutes, four and a half minutes of total annularity. We rented a VRBO cabin on a bluff overlooking uh, Capitol Reef National Park. We did that about a year in advance. And when we got there, there were no vacancy signs all over the place. Um, people said that it was as crowded as a summer weekend. But we were very lucky with the weather. We had clear skies with just a few high wispy clouds. You could see the whole eclipse very well. And I chose the location based on its being on the center line, a relatively high probability in southern Utah of good weather in October. And I also chose the location uh, in Utah as opposed to other states because I've been to Utah many times in the past. And the hiking, I think, is among the best in the country. And I've divided my observations into the lessons learned or, uh, you know, good things and things I would do differently next time. So uh, start with the good things, you know, choose a place that you'll enjoy even if they're clouds. Uh, we hiked every day, including the afternoon after the eclipse. And I highly recommend Capitol Reef National Park. I'd only driven through it previously, uh, but it has great slot canyons, uh, wild four wheel drive. We had a Ford expedition that we rented from Alamo, which did well. Uh, and just outside the park there, uh, a large number of places you can find terrific uh, rock hounding, which I also enjoy. Number two, figure out once you have a place to observe how and where precisely you're going to observe in advance. My rental cabin had a south facing wood deck, which uh, allowed me to set up a camera on a Skywatcher AZ GTI tracking mount in solar track mode with an extension cord to an outside outlet as well as a second uh, tripod with a stellar view 70 millimeter scope with a slip on thousand oaks filter and a batter eight to 24 millimeter zoom eyepiece for visual observation. Number three, I would say set up your equipment way in advance and do test runs. Uh, the day before the eclipse, I watched, uh, I was kind of going trying to madly figure out what to do because I'd been very busy at work. So I watched numerous YouTube videos and then experimented with the solar filter on my camera on the full sun in order to find what I thought would be a good exposure. Um, I brought a Nikon Z9 with a thousand oak screw in solar filter on a 400 millimeter zoom lens. Uh, at the last minute, I bought a 1.4 teleconverter to get an effective length of 560 millimeters. I quickly learned that the widest aperture at that length was F8. I ended up using an ISO setting of 400 and then setting a centered exposure level of 1 1 25th of a second and then using the Nikon's internal intervalometer and auto exposure bracketing settings to take four exposures about a half step apart progressively away from the centered exposure of 101 one twenty-fifths of a second. So this meant I was taking nine shots every time I took an exposure, and I set the intervalometer for every three minutes, trying to have it run automatically before the annularity phase and figuring I'd manually depress another outside the camera intervalometer during the annularity. Well, I ended up getting over 500 shots and some very good ones in both raw and high resolution JPEGs. But what I learned is that it was a good thing I took nine different exposures because the right exposure varies depending how much of the sun is covered by the moon. So um, another thing I would say, two more things on the good side is, um, you know, I think bring something, if you're going to someplace special where you can enjoy the night sky, Capitol Reef happens to be a quote, gold tier uh, dark sky site. And I think it's probably better than uh, than uh, West Virginia and almost having a star party. It's I was really glad I had the small refractor on the uh, the mount, the go to mount. I used it at night a couple times and it was fantastic to go around and find the Messier Messier objects. And uh, 
I also use binoculars. Finally, it was, this is a simple thing, but the last thing I'd recommend is it's great to have some good outdoor seating. Um, you know, in 2017, I was in a park in Nashville. I had four $20 chairs from Amazon, folding chairs. They were great. Here, I was fortunate enough to have some deck chairs. So it's nice to be comfortable when you look at these things. Now, what would I do differently? Uh, number one, I'd develop a written plan next time uh, before the April eclipse, for example, of what I want to achieve. I I quickly read through Alan Dyer's 500 page ebook on eclipse photography and it helped a lot. I recommend it, but I should have taken the time to write up a plan. Uh, number two, for me next time, at least for telephoto purposes, I'm gonna get a longer lens either a thousand millimeter or 1200 millimeter, uh, 600 with a two times teleconverter, perhaps. Number three, Jeff, be that, Jeff, that camera is a, is that a full frame? That is the Nikon Z9. Yep. Um, number three, uh, I want to branch out next time. You'll, you'll see these shots in front of you are all telephoto. I want to take some wide angle shots and figure out how to use photo editing software to stack the shots. Um, number four, next time I'm gonna make sure I've purchased long in advance all of the proper screw in solar filters for all the different lenses I wanted to use. I couldn't use my wide angle this time because I hadn't purchased a solar filter for that lens, which was different diameter than the telephoto. Number five, I would leave the heavy visual refractor at home with its tripod. Now, I just said a moment ago, I loved looking at the night sky, but if I went to a place where the night sky wasn't so dramatic, I would just rely on binoculars. I, I have some good Canon image stabilized binoculars with screw in solar filters, and I brought those, and uh, I just rely on those with the, some of the inexpensive Lunt solar binoculars and the simple naked eye filter glasses. I ended up taking three heavy carry-on bags of expensive gear and also checked three 49-pound bags of luggage. It was a bit much. Uh, number six, I would test all your gear, and I mean all of it, at least two weeks in advance. I successfully used the auto exposure bracketing, but I couldn't get my Nikon's in-camera intervalometer to work. I had to use my manual intervalometer to take shots every three minutes. I'll figure that issue out, but I should have done that in advance. Second, uh, I bought the Skywatcher Solar Quest mount a week before the eclipse and tested it home. And despite multiple attempts, it simply wouldn't work. It would not, as it claimed it would, automatically find and track the sun. So personally, I can't recommend the Solar Quest. Uh, even the AZ GTI tracked poorly when the sun was at a certain angle. Uh, it required some manual help. Uh, it got better after annularity. I think my camera plus my lens was at the limit of the 11 pound capacity. So I'll do more testing. And the, the last thing I would say is bring, everyone says this, but bring and charge extra batteries for every single piece of your equipment. I brought an extra camera battery and in fact, I had to substitute it into my camera about two minutes before annularity because the other one had run out. So I was really glad I had that. But the night before, I also tested a wireless intervalometer to make it less likely of you'd have camera shake. And the button cell battery in it had died and I didn't have an extra. So those are my thoughts. And I look forward to going to Fredericksburg, Texas, about an hour and a half west of Austin and on the center line uh, next April. And hopefully we'll, have, we'll all have clear skies. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Um, I've got a question. Did you um, did you use the mount for just keeping the sun centered? Your exposures were short enough. But did you use the, did you use the mount and did you polar align it at night? Is that what you did? Uh, no, for keeping the... The uh, AZ GTI uh, centered, it has a solar track mode. And once you enter all of the equipment in the manual keypad, um, 
And that means your latitude, your longitude, your day, your time zone, uh, all of that. And, uh, and then you center the sun in its utility function. It is then supposed to track. So okay. per perhaps if I had uh, taken the extra step of polar aligning it the night before and then, uh, you know, picking it up from there, uh, that might have been a bit better. Okay, thanks. Okay, let's um, let's move on. Um, oops. Mike Corrin. Um, Mike um, sent a long written report. Thank you, Mike, which I've uh, posted already on uh, Google Drive. We're not going to go through that whole thing. But if you would talk about your slides, uh, your images, I appreciate that. Okay, sure. Um, so, um, I mean, you can read it here. We were, uh, my son and I were in Pleasanton, Texas, which is um, a little bit south of San Antonio. And um, the uh, in the days leading up to the eclipse, I was looking at the various uh, forecasts. And the night before, it didn't look very promising there for, uh, for clear skies. I was looking at both the, um, the Canadian Meteorology Center, the clear sky chart, uh, mm -hmm. as well as the NOAA, um, you know, the U.S. Um, cloud cover, uh, sky cover forecast. And uh, what I thought was kind of interesting and um, a little bit typical uh, was that it seemed like on both forecasts, the line between 50% clouds and 10% clouds ran concurrent with the line of annularity in that section of Texas. <laughs> So um, we, uh, you know, if, if we had more time and felt like a longer road trip within a road trip, we might have gone further north. But as it is, we drove um, about 200 miles up to up uh, I-10 to Sonora, Texas. Uh, and um, it was, you know, it, it was um, sort of hazy. There were light clouds moving in and out um, as we were setting up. Uh, you can see the picture on the right there is uh, that's one of the first ones I took uh, after setting up. So by the time we got there, um, the eclipse was already in progress. And then, um, you know, it it uh, it got a little bit better and then it just completely clouded over. Not completely, but it it got very cloudy over the sun, probably 20 minutes before uh, annularity. And it only, um, you know, as as annularity began it did the clouds did start to thin out a bit so i was able to take some images like like the one in the middle or the one uh the one on the next page which is the one i had posted on the uh on the novak listserv um you can see there are some you know some clouds uh some cloudiness along the rim there but uh i was pleased with with what we had with, with uh at least being able to get this um i was using um uh i guess uh uh, Alan had asked me to kind of concentrate on um, how I focused, and uh, I don't know that I necessarily have any any magic method or words of wisdom. I was using um, a Canon um, EOS uh, mirror mirrorless camera uh, and a uh, and a Canon uh, RF 800 millimeter f11 lens, and uh, the way I focused, um, if if you look, um, sorry, if you can go back to the previous slide the picture on the right, you can see a couple of sunspots. And I was just looking at, at the, um, the image on the, uh, on the rear LCD screen. And um, the, the camera lets me zoom in um, for manual focus, uh, 5X and 10X. So I was zoomed all the way in and I just was manually focusing the lens right on one of those sunspots. Um, so that was, that was really all I did um, I think I think a lot of it. I, I definitely got lucky um, with it, but I think also, you know, if you if you take pictures of the sun or the moon on a regular basis, or if you're if you're used to looking at the moon under under moderate magnification, you can always see kind of the waves of the atmosphere flowing across it. And I think, um, you know, in this case, it just I just got lucky that there were some clear, uh, some more clear areas where there might be some some edge detail on the moon. Although I also notice, I also notice that at some points along the edge of the sun, it looks like there are mountains kind of at the top right there. So um, 
you know, I think it kind of works both ways in that regard. Yeah, I had um, when I talked with you, I, I thought of the sun's edge, which made me think that some of it might be real. Um, but I, I was impressed by how sharp that was. A lot of times people have um, either because of a little bit of overexposure or because of scattered light, whatever. They just don't seem to get that sharpness in the partial phases and the annular. So that's a nice ring. Okay. The mount um, I was using was a, um, a Skywatcher um, Star Adventurer GTI, which is a, um, it, it's a, it's a, I forget how much it costs, five or $600. It's a go-to, uh, lightweight go-to mount. Um, and I talked in the report that I sent, I talked about my difficulty daytime polar aligning it, but in reality, it was good enough. I didn't have to make too many, um, too many changes, you know, too many adjustments, maybe every 10 minutes or so, I'd have to press one of the buttons. Uh, the nice thing about that mount is that it can be controlled with an app on the phone. And so things like entering the exact time and your exact location uh, is done automatically. It gets that information from the phone. So, so you have that. Um, for next time, I mean, I felt like I felt like I had good. My, my equipment worked well. Um, I had a good setup. Um, I had I had this. I had bought this mount probably about six months ago, and since then, um, I had gone out in front of my house, pretty much uh, every every other weekend at least, whenever it was clear, and just set it up and took pictures of the sun and tried to see what I got. Um, to see about exposures, as well as knowing, to, just having a, a sense of how to use it and how to set it up. Um, so I think I think that definitely helps a lot, um, which also echoes what what Jeff had said uh, about practicing beforehand. Um, what one interesting um, contrast, and it, it was interesting to hear Jeff say he, he's going to go with a longer lens um, in April. My thought was um, I want to go with a, a shorter lens in April because this lens I used um, is 800 millimeters on, a, on an APS-C, on a crop sensor. Um, it, it's um, the, uh, the width of the, the image um, size is only, I think about one by 1 1.6 degrees, the true field of view. So I'm thinking for the total eclipse in April, go with something more like a 400 or possibly even a 600 millimeter lens uh, just to just to have some more, um, just to be able to capture really the whole uh, extended corona, if that's visible, because I think that could certainly go out to a couple of degrees. That's but, right, uh, and um, yeah, and and you have to remember it's a couple, it's it's a degree or a couple of degrees on each side, mm -hmm. so the the image can be significantly larger. Plus, it may be a little bit more difficult to get the sun centered in the time you have. Yeah. So you want to leave a little bit of margins, you know, probably the worst thing is to come back and find out you clipped off half of the Corona. Um, that'd be really disappointing. Yeah. Uh, that was one of my lessons learned from 2017 that I was very lucky with my crew, with my crude setup. And um, I need to be more systematic in April. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, the, nice, the nice thing about digital photography and digital cameras is that you can see in real time what your images look like. So you can you can make adjustments to the exposure and the framing uh, and in real time. That's what I did with this image that's on the screen now um, because it was through a pretty thick layer of clouds. So the image I had the the uh, exposure I had calculated beforehand and and was using uh, wasn't cutting it. Yeah, I think that's trickier to do in a total phase. Probably, uh, yeah. Both, both because the, the range of brightnesses in the corona is so wide, mm -hmm. and you've got so many other things you're trying to do and you're thinking about yeah. that amount of time. That's, that's, um, just getting the sun properly exposed is enough of a challenge, as you've done here to try to get the corona properly exposed. And it's very faint, too. You, you're, mm -hmm. you're hoping to photograph portions of the corona which you can't see in live view or live focusing sure well good report thank you mike thank you um 
All right. So next we're going to have Dave Dunham, and I think he's going to share his his strain. Yes. Uh, I've got one one frame that he sent to Novak, which is a, a teaser. So, right. Dave, if you can share, um, we'll watch from your view. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, it's, of course, a joint effort with my wife. Uh, so, um, um, and of course, uh, we've been doing eclipses for quite a few years with the International Occultation Timing Association. Uh, there's our website, and I have our Mid-Atlantic Occultations page after that. Uh, you're probably familiar with some of that from my occultation post. Um, so anyway, for the eclipse, uh, first, uh, where to observe. Well, it was pretty easy for us. Uh, we were at our place in Fountain Hills, Arizona at the time. So it was only a four-hour drive to Gallup, New Mexico to get on the southern limit. Uh, we wanted to observe from the edge of the eclipse uh, because uh, that maximizes the Bailey's beads phenomenon. Uh, and uh, uh, so the, the uh, moon sort of rolls around the edge of the sun, you know, at the contact point. And so you get um, a whole uh, series of beads, which I'll try to show in the video. Um, whoops, uh, let's see. Next. Okay. Then uh, <clears throat> the cloud cover forecast, you know, we... Of course, New Mexico has pretty good climate, uh, but um, uh, the weather is what you get, and so you have to pay attention to that. But even two days beforehand, uh, conditions were um, quite good. Here's Albuquerque and Gallup um, is to the left uh, of Albuquerque um, near the uh, border with Arizona. Uh, so, um, we, so, but uh, we wanted to be closer, so... Um, uh, next, uh, we went to um, um, Javier Zubier's uh, um, website, which takes into account the both the terrestrial terrain and the uh, lunar terrain and uh, generates a Google map. With anywhere you can click on it, you can uh, get something like this. Um, now, I tried to get the one for our site. Uh, I thought I'd made a screenshot safe, but I hadn't. Um, but somehow, um, uh, Javier's uh, website is down now, so I just took this from another observer who was in Nevada. Um, but uh, <laughs> once I got the location, I wrote down the information in a little text file, um, uh, giving the coordinates here that we wanted to be at, um, which was close to the intersection of New Mexico Highway 118. Um, and then at that point, annularity was pre the corrected uh, annularity uh, with limb corrections uh, was predicted to last eight seconds. Um, so um, we didn't bother to um, simulate it in more detail. Right on. Oh, these calculations, which were pretty good. Um, this was the mid-time 1633.58 UT um, and with this altitude and azimuth. Um, the uh, <coughs> We were using a RunCan camera, an IOTA a camera that has different brightness settings, and we uh, um, had uh, uh, and did, did some tests uh, three days before, which indicated a gain of four and a brightness of 84 was pretty good. But when we actually got to the eclipse, we found that was too bright, and we had to decrease the gain. We decreased it down to two, and the brightness down to about 30. Um, and the, the idea is to try to get a good focus on sunspots. If you can see the penumbra of the sunspots, um, you've, um, and also, you know, of course, check the edge of the moon. Um, you, you are about the best focus you can get. And that's what we wanted to show the beads as well as we could. Um, and uh, where exactly to observe uh, this, uh, now, the previous one showed the predicted. This shows the actual um, coordinates measured from our IOTA video time inserter in the position mode. Um, so this was the place as we drove up to it, to the coordinates that uh, we just put in Google Earth. Um, saw this uh, 
gift shop uh, we found out was um, closed at the time, but uh, the owner was very gracious to let us use his property around it. And uh, he, uh, you know, he said that, uh, you know, maybe in a year or two, it'll be up and ready for um, business. Uh, this, <clears throat> we selected a site uh, among some, uh, uh, a little bit away from the building. Um, this shows a view of the building from close to our site uh, where we actually observed, um, which, uh, uh, so we were not bothered by any people or anything. And the fellow there um, had to go on an errand, so he missed our activity. Uh, but uh, this shows the um, view uh, to the east from our site, uh, showing uh, that uh, the sun was visible. Um, and uh, the interstate highway um, is uh, uh, beyond these trees a few hundred feet. Uh, so um, we didn't have any bother from that. Um, and this shows us starting to set up our equipment. Um, and it just shows the, um, the camera that my wife took some pictures of our setups, a little better than some of these, but um, this shows the, the telescope. It's a 127 millimeter um, Schmidt Maxitov, uh, you know, Nexstar, Celestron Nexstar telescope. And you, we are using just a, a standard glass filter, which fit it would be ordered from Orion. <laughs> and uh, showing the finder scope, you know, showing with its uh, smaller, um, just a Mylar filter. And it worked quite well. The Nexstar uh, tracks the sun. You can do a you know, single object, uh, solar system aligned, and uh, that worked fine. Um, this uh, just shows Joan with the telescope, and all you can see of the equi other equipment really is a black towel that we got uh, from a nearby Walmarts, and uh, or actually we got it, uh, you know, before we left uh, our place in uh, near Phoenix, um, but. Um, we actually had the laptop in a uh, small carry-on suitcase, uh, not this one, but another one. This was, um, uh, and um, that way we could, uh, um, um, we put the uh, lid of the uh, laptop on the base of the uh, roll-on suitcase. And so the keyboard was pointing up against the side and then you could close the lid of it to, exclude more of the sunlight and uh, with the, with the black towel it, it worked quite well um, so this just is another view looking towards the the highway and the and there's a railroad track farther away um, but uh, it was very nice location and uh, this just shows a preliminary picture uh, showing the um, settings that we actually used a uh, max gain of two and a brightness of 32. And the Runcan camera has integrations. And so we had that set at one, the lowest. Now you can, uh, <coughs> now the night shutter three um, gives you um, eight uh, field integration, which allows you to record fainter stars for occultation events, but for eclipses, they you don't need that. Uh, so, um, and this shows this nice sunspot spot group. Um, the um, um, the um, uh, we, I got video of the moon occulting um, both the upper and the uh, lower sunspot group. Looks like there's even a little one uh, to the side too, but uh, you can see it's in uh, quite good focus. So that's what we wanted. Um, and uh, for our work, we also want to know what the limb darkening function is. And so a picture like this will give you that um, to define the edge of the uh, sun for the analysis. Um, um, I'll show the video after this. I just wanted to mention 
total eclipses, we observe the um, total eclipse of 2019 July um, in San Juan, Argentina. Um, and uh, in fact, our hotel room was within about a couple of hundred meters of where I wanted to be. So I said, well, let's just observe from the roof of the hotel rather than go out to the countryside, which we were originally planning to do. And that worked great. Uh, so, um, of course, the moon, the sun's altitude was fairly low then. It was about 12 degrees or so. Um, I should also mention during the annular eclipse, um, and people notice, you know, of course, you can notice the uh, slight darkening. Um, and then uh, it also it brightens when the annual eclipse is over. Shortly after the annual eclipse, the uh, uh, chickens uh, uh, at this uh, place, um, you know, this guy had a, a small uh, uh, farm as well as that gift shop, and the chickens noticed and started uh, um, announcing the second sunrise. <laughs> um, so this shows just some Bailey's beads photos from the uh, that total eclipse in 2019, and um, um, uh, and, and then uh, we had two cameras there. We had the next star. Uh, like we actually got the next star for that eclipse, and uh, was quite successful. But um, uh, Joan ran a separate camera um, uh, showing the. Um, um, a color camera um, so that we could record uh, um, prominences and Bailey's beads, uh, the chromosphere. Um, for a total eclipse, being at the edge also gives some advantages um, with Bailey's beads, just like the annular eclipse, uh, but also um, visibility of the chromosphere. Um, you can see more detail and color of that. Um, and um, and of course, the inner corona in that area uh, near the sun. Um, and um, uh, you mentioned uh, nearing that for that Kalamazoo series, Fred Bruinges is going to be talking about that. He got a very good uh, recording of the 2017 eclipse from his home in Missouri, which was uh, just a mile and a half or so from the southern limit. And this is the link to it. I'll try to show it um, and if we have time. But um, uh, next, I'm going to try to um, um, go to uh, what I think I do. I think I'll stop my screen sharing and then jump back in so I can grab the uh, video. Dave, Dave yeah. I think we have to pick it up a little bit because there are other people who, who are going to present their results, too. Right, right. This is the end of my slideshow, so I just wanted to, okay. um, to show a little bit of the uh, uh, video that I got, um, uh, which is um, here. Okay, do you see it now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'll just try to slide through. This is after annularity here, but I'll just do a quick slide so you can. Um, see, I'll slide forward now. You can see we had a minute and a half of the beads before. Okay, and I'll, I'll play yes, it for sir. this. Some of that is uh, prominences on the sun, and some of it's uh, prominences on the moon, right? Well, it's all um, all photosphere of the sun, um, and um, and the lunar topography down there. The lunar mountains have uh, um, now completely broken, and you see the annularity. Um, and um, in 10 seconds, you will see the, the new beads um, on the lower part. There, you can see the beads starting again. And uh, I'll just, uh, just move it forward. And you can see we had quite a nice sequence there. So um, and there are other people doing this at the northern limit. Um, uh, so uh, we, and the northern limit's better for an annular eclipse for beads because the southern mountains on the moon are higher, um, are, are larger topography, and uh, so um, um, so so. But but uh, you can see we got quite good 
uh, events here. So, um, so that's what I wanted to show you. Um, I think I'll, I'll just stop my sharing now. One thing that uh, Bruenja's uh, video is really great. You should look at it. Uh, you know, I had the link in my presentation at the end. Uh, so um, look at that when you get a chance. And I'll send an email about it too, um, uh, just to get an idea of what a total eclipse looks like from the edge. And quite spectacular. So are there any questions? Thanks, David. I know you're you're encouraging people to observe from the from the edge, even in the total eclipse, right? <laughs> yeah, make more measurements yeah. like that. Right, right. If you've seen the corona um, well enough, and a lot of people are photographing it, um, if you want to try to do something different, um, I highly recommend it. Okay, um, and, and as um, as was suggested, maybe we'll invite you back to talk a little bit more in detail about what people really learn in the science from these kinds of observations and, and the post-processing that might be involved um, and, and how it, because it really is a kind of occultation. It's a very oh, yeah. specialized occultation. That's for but, sure. But you're the guy we can learn from. So <laughs> thanks very much for presenting that. Um, let me try to um, share Dan Ward's while, while um, Dave was doing that, I tried to pull up, um, Dan Ward's images. Uh, what happened? Okay, while well, you're pulling those up, I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, okay, I was please. I was in Uvalde, Texas, and Eclipse Day went to uh, Garner State Park. Uh, it was. Uh, this is probably my least successful solar eclipse experience as far as uh, hardware and cloud issues, but quite possibly one of my more fun solar eclipse trips. So, you know, do the balance on that. The uh, uh, <clears throat> what I had uh, gone there with the intention to observe outside of Hondo, Texas, but when I found out that Kate, Dr. Kate Rousseau was going to be at Garner State Park, uh, Kate and I have been friends for six or seven years. Never met her in person before. It's always been long video conferences and things like that. So it was a chance to, to meet one of the world's foremost uh, eclipse experts, author of multiple books and all that. So I couldn't pass up that opportunity. Glad I did. Spent some good quality time with Kate doing the eclipse. That's her on the left. Uh, heck of a nice person. In the middle photo there, that's the rig I set up. Some of you re remember uh, a couple of months ago, we had uh, Matt Penn from the Dynamic Eclipse Broadcast Initiative, and I'm one of the participants in that. <clears throat> uh, I was using their equipment. I had done multiple runs with it using my own laptop. Everything worked well. I had done multiple pilots. I decided to, to do a parallel mount. And on, on the left left side was the uh, Deb setup, which was an ASCAR 180 astrograph uh, setup for measurements with the, uh, their supplied camera and gear sitting on, and it's sitting on a Sky Hunter mount. <clears throat> on the right side, I added my own uh, Daystar uh, Solar Scout 60 so I could have the hydrogen alpha scope experience. And, and what I had done in my practicing and test ones was I, I had a uh, Teleview uh, smartphone holder on the, uh, on the uh, Solar Scout, which gave you some pretty nice imaging. So I was looking forward to having uh, this nice, simple setup. Got there, polar aligned, uh, you know, in the daytime, really no problem at all. Uh, while we were waiting, this... Uh, uh, giant red-headed centipede you can see in there came by i mean it was kind of interesting okay alan if you want to go ahead and skip down if you could to mm -hmm. the uh maybe we'll we can skip that's fred espinox posting that he did a couple of days ago and so that you know that's what it looks like when it's done right 
It was cloudy the whole damn time, okay? Couldn't even see the sun often. Could never use the solar filters because of the amount of cloud uh, detail there. So f visually, it was interesting because although it was cloudy, you didn't need solar filters. These were taken with my iPhone. No filter at all. You could look at it naked eye. It was incredible. <laughs> I've never seen a naked eye solar annular eclipse. You know, so that part of it was kind of cool. Now, the hardware, I had this incredible uh, you know, equipment that was part of the dev project, which cost about $2,000. Uh, people who waited to uh, got the dev equipment provided for them. I bought my own because I was in early, you know, fool that I was. But uh, a week before the eclipse, they sent me a what was reported as a nasa provided laptop so i said okay my laptop is seven years old on its last legs so cool i've got a brand new laptop i quickly tested it with a setup everything worked fine so i go to new Valdi and i have this wonderful little nasa laptop <clears throat> when i got out to the park uh the lap Dan, your image froze up. Well, everything, the, the camera, everything was running off of the laptop. I did not have an alternate source. You know, if I'd been at home, if I'd driven, I would have had my alternate power sources. There was not alternate. This is a big park. There were 8,000 people there. There was not alternate power. So basically, 15 minutes into after first contact, my hardware is a brick. And so I... I quickly realize that there's no really easy way to solve this problem. So I did what I've been telling people to do for uh, many years. And that is sit back and just look at the eclipse. Don't worry about taking photos. And since I couldn't do the, the scientific experiment that I had committed to, I had the opportunity to sit back in a lawn chair enjoy the heck out of the eclipse and take a bunch of photos with my smartphone, which as you can see, they're not bad, really. I mean, they're, they're, they're not as good as the photos that any of the rest of you are showing, but, uh, you know, it was interesting. Now, it was interesting with having such a heavy overcast. Um, there, there were no ability to do any kind of projections. Uh, we tried, didn't work. Uh, there were a whole bunch of people that had, you know, those those wonderful sun spotter scopes, love them. They cost $500. They didn't work in the clouds. You know? <laughs> I mean, it, it was just interesting. It was a unique experience. I got to talk to some fun people. I actually got to enjoy the cultural aspects of an eclipse much more than I ever have, and there's some dozens of it. Uh, Kate told me this was her 19th eclipse, and she said it was... <laughs> On its own merits, it was one of the coolest ones she'd ever been to. So, so that's my story. And then, unfortunately, on the way home, I got I, I picked up COVID. But uh, anyway, it was well worth a trip, an interesting experience. Thanks, Dan. Um, those those pictures through the clouds have interesting textures. To them. You can probably work on them and come up with something you'll be at happy to post on the wall yeah it i actually because I had such sophisticated gear i left my camera at home the the camera that has been my old standby i had you know uh, who was it i think it was jeff talking earlier i had uh two 50 pound bags uh i just couldn't squeeze anything else into it and then as it turned out you know if I'd had my 35 millimeter camera or my DSLR, I probably would have been scrambling like crazy. Probably wouldn't have enjoyed it as much. But uh, iPhone uh, uh, 12 Max uh, photos are okay for this trip. I love the fact that all, after all that equipment, your iPhone took took your shots. I think that's yeah. great. Yeah. Live and like learn. Pinholes. It's the peripheral. It's the unexpected that turns out to be the highlight. Thank Dan, God for serendipity, uh, right? Yeah. Dan, could you repeat again exactly what failed because you were breaking up and it didn't come through exactly what that key problem was? All the, basically, the laptop failed. 
and the laptop was providing power to everything else, yeah. unfortunately. So the, the mount no longer, well, the mount, actually the mount worked the entire clips because it had its own internal battery, but uh, everything else was dead. Thank you. All right. So, Jeff, if you could pick up on. Uh... Oh, that's right. Jeff, Jeff uh, wasn't sure I'd be able to get here. So um, he he sent sort of a, a written report also. He was uh, he was at Corpus Christi. Uh, and the, the picture on the top, obviously, is is his setup. Um, he, he has uh, he told a story. I think he sent it to the, the club about uh, uh, setting up a, next to someone who he thought might be uh, an interesting fellow amateur astronomer who turned out to be some nutcase who was trying to figure out what really what really caused the sun to disappear because he didn't believe it was the moon. Um, so Jeff said he uh, carefully moved away from that person. These are the pictures he got uh, apparently through some clouds and uh, he sent his lessons learned in writing uh, i'm going to um, post these to the to the file system too um, he mentions here in number four something which dan had mentioned before and and i followed up it's a sort of a good idea to get something large to shade your camera something you can put around the lens to shade the camera because sitting out in the sun, it can get quite hot um, before and after the eclipse while you're getting things set up. He found that was successful. And he's also got some recommendations on magnification, which was oops, magnification, which was useful. Um, bringing along sunscreen because you're going to be outside under the sun for a long time, hopefully, if it's cloud free. And he's got some other recommendations. So I'm going to skip ahead because time is short. Um, Mark Minterich uh, submitted a couple of pictures to the club. He didn't respond to this meeting. I don't think he's online. Um, but I, I pulled out his image because it was an interesting example of the thing called the uh, the funnel projector, which is uh, an online um, technique for doing eclipse projection uh, using eyepiece projection from a telescope of any kind, in this case, a big funnel that you buy in an auto parts store for draining oil can oil uh, pan on your car and um, do an appropriate modification so it can be mounted around the eyepiece of your telescope and you put a translucent layer on the open end of the funnel and it makes a very effective projection device uh, and in other pictures he showed he did have a solar filter on for this also, you don't use the full sun. Uh, normally, well, not just normally, uh, it would be dangerous to use the full brightness of the sun, not because it's dangerous on the screen, but because it's concentrated on the air piece, on the eyepiece, and you can literally destroy your eyepiece with the concentrated sunlight. So you still have to use a filter, even though you're not directly viewing the sun. Okay, next up we got candy. Uh, who is online, I see, and yeah. she sent her pictures from Utah. Yeah, I have some slides, too. If you want to let me share my screen, I can go through them real quickly. That's fine. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Can you see? Yep. Okay. Okay. So um, we went to uh, Tory, Utah, as well, just like Jeff Cook. So hi, Jeff. <laughs> Didn't see you there, but um, that's pretty cool that we were in the same place. Um, Hello. <laughs> my my husband and I made a road trip out of this, so we're hikers as well. So that was, um, you're spot on about the hiking out there. It's absolutely fantastic. And we basically made a horse tour around the entire state and hiked every single one to the Mighty Five and also went down to um, Page in Northern, Ari uh, Northern Arizona and took a look at Horsky Bend and all that. So that was kind of cool. But um, this first image that you're looking at is actually the Airbnb where we ended up at the end of our trip um, just outside of Capitol Reef. And uh, this tiny little mountain on the backside is actually on the southern side. Uh, the, the reason that we booked this, and I also, like Jeff, booked this about a year out. Um, as soon as that calendar opened, 
um, because I had been looking for places out west in the past um, that we could uh, that we could stay at. And uh, this place uh, appealed to me because they had an image um, that showed uh, where the sun comes up. And I knew that the eclipse was going to happen in the early morning. And um, they had this on the back side of that property. They actually had two decks, a lower deck and an upper deck and this little stairwell that went up to it. And it was on the eastern side and uh, had this little spot where I could set up, a, you know, a tripod and be right there and have a clear view. So I was like, OK, well, this is probably going to be a good place. And even if that's not the, the perfect place, which actually ended up not being, uh, I could clearly see that that area was pretty wide open. So, And we knew that um, we were going to have uh, the max view there in Torrey um, for a whole, uh, you know, four minutes and 42 seconds, which was kind of cool. So that was where we ended up. Um, I used the PhotoPills app, which I'm not super familiar with. Uh, it's fairly new to me. And um, I was using it to try to figure out where the sun was actually going to be in, in its path along the edge of this uh, tiny mountain on the backside of the property. And uh, originally, I was in that spot on the on the stairwell and also on the top deck. And I, I'm not sure if it was a factor of my unfamiliarity with the app or um, that something was not quite right with it. But the position of the sun kind of jumped around a little bit, and I didn't trust it. So um, I ended up actually in the driveway out front, which was worked out perfectly well. Um, my equipment was like Canon EOS RP mirrorless. I uh, used a 600 millimeter Sigma lens and a thousand of solar filter with the Skywatcher Ventura Pro. Um, I did a rough alignment during the day, in the morning. Um, I tried to look at the path of the sun uh, the, the day before. And it was the only cloudy day that we had the whole 10 days we were in Utah, um, of course. So I wasn't, um, I wasn't sure exactly where the sun was going to be. And uh, so I set up out in the driveway the next morning and I just did a rough alignment. I knew that I wasn't going to be able to center the sun the entire time anyway, because my, I knew that my equipment was going to be unbalanced. I need a, uh, a dovetail mount for uh, my tracker and I don't have one yet. So uh, that 600 millimeter lens is pretty heavy. And uh, so I knew that it was not gonna be balanced quite right and I was gonna have to monitor it, kind of baby it a little bit and adjust it um, occasionally. And that is exactly what happened. Um, but it was not super problematic, although for next time, I think I'll definitely make sure I have that um, so that I can balance it properly. Um, like I said, I tried to check the location the day before, and that just didn't work out. But um, And I did the rough uh, polar alignment. I set up the camera so that I was um, getting bracketed shots, just three every two minutes. And uh, I had an ISO setting of 100 at 6.3. And my exposures varied between 1, 1, 125th and um, 0.4. Um, that was a really bright one that you saw in the, in the previous image. Um, so then I thought, okay, well, I'm ready to go. And I had a checklist uh, in my iPhone of all the settings in my camera before I got there um, because I have I have made mistakes before where I've had one setting off and I've wasted a ton of time and so I hate wasting time. So I made a checklist and I knew every single I wrote down every single menu and every single setting that I wanted and I went through and I put I turned all those on uh, before I set everything up so that I wouldn't have to think of it on the fly or remember it and that worked out really well. Um, Near annularity, I disabled the timer that I had set, and um, I just uh, controlled it manually, so I could just play around with the exposure. Um, and that was a little that was a little fun. I got some brighter images that were kind of cool. Um, and then after annularity, then I just checked it again and re-enabled the timer and let it run. And I ended up um, I ended up missing uh, the very very end of um, the eclipse, like the very the very last part, um, somehow, I, I'm not sure what happened, but I know it wasn't my batteries because I've also had problems with my batteries and I had batteries uh, upon batteries upon batteries. I made sure I had lots of power and that I wasn't gonna run. I even had a um, external power source if I needed it, uh, but I never did, so that was good. Um, but you can see my, my mount on the left and how crazy that lens is. Um, so definitely need to uh, help that thing out next time and not burn out my motor. <laughs> And this is what I ended up with, and I thought it was kind of cool. I did get some um, sunspots in some of the images, which was kind of neat. Um, 
I didn't really do anything specific to get those. I just, uh, like someone earlier described before, I just zoomed in as far as I could and just manually focused it and locked the focus down. And then I didn't have to touch it the rest of the time. So, um, and then I got some interesting ones. I think I bumped, I bumped it. That's the one you got on the left with the double, which is kind of interesting, obviously not realistic, but I thought it was neat. And then the others are just you know, me playing around with the exposure while it was, um, in the annular phase. Is Candy? Is that your range of was that your range of exposures on that mosaic from one hundred twenty fifth to point four? Yes, yes, yes. Point four, point four was the really, really bright one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Oh yeah, and I made this um uh little uh, time lapse with uh, all the photos I took. And you'll see where I made my adjustments when I had to adjust when it went out of frame. I didn't have it nearly in the center at all the entire time because I was afraid of which way it was going to go. So, Oops. And there you can see at the end, I, I missed the, the very end of it. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So I think that was my last slide. Oh, here we go. Um, so I don't know if you can do this slide, but my recommendations are um, you definitely want to have a checklist so you don't have to think about it. I, you know, everybody stressed beforehand. I, this was my first time ever photographing an eclipse. Uh, it was really my first time ever actually seeing a, a, an eclipse that went this far. It wasn't just a partial. And um, and it was really cool to to see. And um, I felt like having a checklist really um, allayed my uh, anxiety about what was going on with the camera and allowed me to kind of um, focus on, you know, what was happening, especially during annularity, just sit back and watch it for a minute. Um, definitely need to make sure that my mount is balanced better for the tracking next time. Uh, and also made a note to be careful taking the glasses off when I'm looking through the eyepiece because sometimes you, you get busy and you forget to put them back on before you look up at the fly. <laughs> so I did that very briefly for just a second. I was like, oh, I have to put those back on. Um, I thought the bracketing was really helpful and um, it wasn't windy where I was, but I did have a sandbag um, and uh, I borrowed some rocks from the property where I had to fill it just in case um, because you don't want that messing with your, uh, with your images. But that is all I have. Any questions? I don't know if you saw Rich Bergman suggested it was the wedding ring nebula when you kicked it. Um, I think when you kicked it. <laughs> Andy, how, how did you like the the Star Adventurer? Uh, I'm thinking next time of using the. Uh, I have a similar iOptron Pro uh, Sky Track Star Tracker, and I was thinking of using that. Well, um, I, I have the lowest grade star adventure there is. It's like $300 or something like that. It's not very expensive. Um, I've actually gotten quite used to it and I don't mind it at all. I, I, I think it works just great for what I need it for. And it would work even better if I used it properly, <laughs> but I don't always. So that's my own fault, but, um, uh, I've not had any issues with it. And, uh, and, and, but the other thing is I've never used anything else. So I don't know anything else. Thanks. Thanks, Candy. Okay, sure. so we ha we have uh, one more presenter, to, um, Troy Rydell. Well, he sent uh, he sent a nice presentation, and I'll just step through it. Um, see his animation going. Yep. Okay, he. He put some effort into his slide deck too, like Candy did, um, and uh, he talked about uh, where he went. He set up in Central Texas, south of San Angelo. Um, he put a lot of text into his uh, into his messages. Uh, his lessons learned about planning for the weather, and he was set for backup locations. I haven't talked about these slides with him, so I just have what he what he presented uh he uh not one observation which i think was with may before but you don't need a big telescope 
with the eclipse. You've got, especially for an annular eclipse or a partial eclipse, because you've got lots of light. Um, so he chose his C90 for portability. And he had a solar max for viewing. I take it that these are handhelds with his uh, H-alpha setup, where he saw the prominences. And he wasn't set up primarily for photography. He was set up for visual, uh, and he just did some handheld. Uh, okay, that's what it says in here. He was just going to do viewing, but he ended up taking some uh, cameras through the telescope, camera views through the telescope. So that's all he had, and we did Dan Ward's. Uh, so this is, hey, we're almost on time. Um, I want to thank all the presenters. As I said, there were a few other people, um, Lloyd Franklin and uh, I think Kevin, who also have slides that I got very late. And uh, I think we'll we'll plan on uh, working with those at the next uh, at the next session. And the next the next part of this is to talk about when we do the next session. Um, but before we go into that, does anybody else have any eclipse observations or on, on the annular eclipse or something you've learned recently you want to share with everybody on on getting ready for the total eclipse? Uh, can I say something? Sure. Um, I'm keep for for the total i'm going to be hopefully staying on private property you know in a, in a pretty good place but i i think i'm keeping track of the texas state parks and if i'm not mistaken the deadline the you can reserve five months in advance and so that's coming up in early november so if you're thinking of trying to reserve a Texas State Park. And I have two I'm looking at. One is called Lost Maples and one is Garner. And hopefully I won't need them. I may try to reserve anyways. Uh, I believe this window will open then. Now there may be people who can game the system and they'll start two weeks early and book for two weeks and it's all full. I don't know. But I'm gonna try around you know, the first few days of November looking into that so if you're interested in that uh that the week after next is your opportunity i think or the next okay next. and you broke up a little bit that that applies to all texas state parks yes it's, is that for campsites you're talking about yes i i can put a plug in for garner that's uh it's 1800 acres approximately they there were 8,000 people there the day I was there. You never would have guessed there were that many people in that park. I mean, yeah. at the site I was observing, there were 800 people uh, that had come. But also mentioned, that's in Uvalde County. And of course, the town of Uvalde is where the terrible shooting was a couple of years ago. They are doing a lot of outreach for to promoting being the eclipse crossroads of America because both eclipses... Uh, Cross in Uvalde County, um, and they are they're doing that a lot to rebuild the community. Uh, you know, I, I won't. I, I can't go there. It took me too long to talk about it, and it's somewhat emotional. But it was an incredible to see how this community has rebounded from such a horrific incident, and the eclipse has been a major part of that. Just getting the positive excitement and all the things. Uh, the festivals, the fairs, things like that. There was a lot of stuff going on while I was there, and there'll be way more in uh, April. How far in advance did you book, Dan? Uh, I had booked the hotel uh, 
of course, the annular wouldn't be as bad as it's going to be. Uh, it's probably already hard to find a room in uh, in the town of Uvalde. Uh, but the, the campground, you know, that is a nice part. Um, uh, but, you know, you can certainly try. The good thing is you do have San Antonio nearby, and there's a zillion hotels hotels to stay out there it's about an hour and a half to get from uh, uh san antonio downtown to uh Uvalde, the town of Uvalde. yeah and i i'm dan i'm not sure if you were there for the session but at that AAS uh planning conference the Uvalde people came and talked and they had a they, mm -hmm. they gave a very good description of what they have planned and and you're right, they're taking it very seriously as a matter of community development to do a, yeah. a good job and, and publicity. So it's probably, if you want to go to Texas, and, and it's in southern Texas where the weather should be best, um, it's about as far south as you want to go towards the uh, Rio Grande. If my wife Forget wasn't it. so insistent on going back to Bloomington, Indiana, her and to go to her alma mater for, in April. Yeah, I would definitely want to go back to Uvalde, but but yeah, I I have you, to go where she, the master is going. Yeah, you're not going to need the sunscreen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. But at least at least I got practice now looking at eclipses through clouds. That will be handy in uh, Indiana. I'm in Indiana, yeah. <laughs> yeah. As long as you get the, as long as you get the ND six clouds, not not the not the ND nine. Okay, um, I just want to mention, uh, as, as we start getting towards April, there will be some things which uh, may be appropriate for members of this SIG to, to think about becoming involved in. Um, and you can read them here. Uh, Novak still has lots of Eclipse classes to distribute. Um, some were distributed for the annular in the area, but We'll, we'll have a serious program of uh, trying to put together a serious program of of uh, getting rid of a few thousand eclipse classes, especially to uh, students and uh, to schools and libraries and places like that where we're sure uh, they'll they'll advance STEM. Um, there will probably be requests for Novak people to um, talk to groups about uh, what they should think about, what they should prepare for uh, in in the context of the partial eclipse, which will be visible from this area on April 8th. Uh, we've already gotten, I think, some inquiries about people who are thinking about getting help for people on April 8th. People will probably be heading to the vicinity of the total eclipse. I don't know. It's probably a, a larger number than the people who are actively participating in the SIG but um, I think the people who would be able to understand and explain it are probably interested in going to see it, uh, which means they wouldn't be here to help local uh, local programs. And finally, uh, Dan and um, uh, Chris Kagey did uh, a handout for the October eclipse, and we'll probably be developing a modification of that or maybe some versions of that based on some lessons learned. Um, to um, uh, to pass out so people know precisely uh, about the uh, the uh, conditions for observing the April eclipse, which will be on a school day during school day hours. So um, we'll probably have opportunities to support uh, schools and and maybe have some teach the teachers programs in advance so the teachers know what to say intelligently to their students. And that would be something Novak would be able to, to contribute to. No action needed now, but you might start thinking about it. Uh, for the next session, I think if we try to keep on sort of the same schedule, we'd be running into Thanksgiving next month. So uh, I'm thinking maybe pass on that. Uh, I, I hadn't known about the overflow would have on on presentations on people willing to talk. So maybe that needs some reconsideration, but would have to move it up um, earlier in the month. And I don't know if people will be will be eager to do that. 
I'm thinking more like uh, doing it a couple weeks before Christmas as the next session. People have opinions, thoughts about that, about uh, what a good schedule would be. I like early December, and there were a lot of people that didn't talk tonight that probably have some good stuff. Okay, well, I I think that makes sense. Of course, I was I was saying I didn't think we'd have a session in in October, but then uh, there were so many good, quick displays of uh, of results on the Novak listserv that I figured it would be time to invite people to present, and I think that worked out tonight. Um, I've listed some ideas of future topics, uh, probably in some sense going through a cycle again as we approach the total eclipse in April um, as and as people think about what they're planning to do more, more clearly and as people begin to get their equipment assembled um, as, as they um, have decided to invest. So there are a couple of things, uh, hardware things. Um, we, we actually talked about iPhone Eclipse photography a little bit a couple of sessions ago about the two products um, that, that seem to work for it, or one that's advocating specifically for iPhones and, and uh, Android, uh, and one product that isn't specific made by the same company that um, that seems to work quite well for solar photography in the partial phases. Um Maybe we'll do our own train the trainer session where people talk about lessons learned in explaining the eclipse to others and um, things to keep in mind as you try to bring the concepts of an eclipse, both what causes them and how to observe them to, uh, to the public and people talking about their updated travel plan. So those are just ideas I put down quickly. That might be ready 906 and i think we're pretty much done so can i make a um, comment sure sure you, you've been running these sigs for months now i'm wondering if we should have outreach within novak i mean there's whatever 800 members and we've got 10 tonight and i'm wondering i was thinking a, a general meeting where maybe you have you split up into work groups you know who's going to watch it local we're going to be discussing that over here who's going to travel but look at it visually you know the, the total totality we're going to meet over here those who are interested in you know photography questions and real detailed technical things about that you know so there may be I, I'm just wondering if, if you know, the club, because maybe members in the club go, oh, that's so specialized. I'm not going to join that SIG, you know, they're probably talking about their camera stuff. And a lot of that's true. But, you know, just uh, uh, getting getting a sense of pulse from the the main club of, you know, what do you want to do? And, you know, we can help and all that kind of stuff. I don't know. Maybe you feel that's redundant because you've been advertising these things. And that's, that's true. But um, yeah, I, I I think you're right that people promise group is too specialized. Uh, and, and I don't know how to overcome that. Uh, if um, well, if I was we thinking of an in person in the room, informal gatherings, you split up into different groups. And just talk, no presentations, no this, no that. And you sound people out. What are you doing? What do you do? You have any questions? Would you like to go? You know, and there may be people who haven't, unlike us, they haven't really started thinking about it yet. But the club is here with all these resources to get them spurred up, you know, that we can help you, you know, answer your questions. And there may yeah, be. Now we could. Maybe not. Yeah, and I think I, I think this uh, this group probably could provide um, resource people for for uh, sessions like that. There is physically the logistic problem of um, of the room we have access to, um, or the rooms we have access to at George Mason. Um, we have that one room. There is one 
small room next to it, um, but it it only gets about 40 people at a monthly meeting. Everybody is so comfortable dialing in that they don't bother showing up. Um, and I, I don't know how to get around that. Now, if we offer it up, um, and it could be at a different place, there, there are some library large meeting rooms that we could have, but uh, an open meeting, try to make it more convenient. Um, or we might even make a deal with something like the Arlington Planetarium, who's uh, who periodically asks us for uh, for help with outreach, and and uh, I think they'd be amenable to give us use of the room. But then we'd be sitting in a planetarium seating, so that's not good for discussion. I see what you mean. It'd be kind of difficult. Um, I'll, I'll point yeah. out. I'll point out also too that uh, speaking of people being comfortable online. You know, 10, 12, 15 people show up for the, the live discussion like tonight, but another 60 or 80 end up watching it on YouTube later when we post the recordings. Yeah, the, the, the turnout for viewing has been pretty good. But that doesn't but that doesn't get to your point. And you've got a good one that if we actually got the people together and they started sort of brainstorming what they're thinking about one guy's one person's question leads to somebody else's question and you make more progress i i i don't know how to implement it and if you if you think more about it bill and and come up with a suggestion we can try to do something uh, along those lines yeah i mean maybe um, you need a school gymnasium or something i don't know <laughs> you know <laughs> but, I'll but you know at various times we've looked We've looked like there's some large meeting rooms at, for example, Centerville Library that are available for community meetings. And um, at, at a place like the Centerville Library or some of the, I, I know more about Fairfax, at some of the um, community centers, there are rooms available, some of which would be quite large. And yeah, we could have three or four groups within a large room. Um meeting and talking about things if we could really convince people to get off their couches and come and meet in per person uh, yeah, we, uh, we would need to get a sense of how many at, people at would a different level up. the novo you know it's a problem i don't I, I you know like i said people are comfortable dialing into things and they don't show up anymore um you know, they physically oh, show up at Sky Meadows for uh, astronomy for everyone. But yeah, of the 800, not many really come together. And that's that's a problem the officers have been trying to, to figure out how to overcome because we want it to be a social group, not just an online discussion group. And it's tough. I wonder if uh, even uh, the uh, Ubar Hazi uh, events in the uh... I don't. I, I guess we don't have a lot of a uh, star party, public star. Well, we have our regular monthly things, but but as far as uh, stargaze and astronomy days, I guess we only have astronomy day between now and April. But it, it could be before one of those, as opposed to prep one of those, as opposed to uh, I don't know. I like yeah. the idea. But I I just can't figure out the logistics either. Yeah, at the Udvar Hazi, we did try to, we, we did speak to um, Sean about, um, you know, whether we could have access to a room there occasionally for some kind of event. And she said it is very hard for them to make a room available to an outside group, uh, unless it's directly related to something that they're sponsoring. Uh, and they do have classrooms in Udvar Hazi. I know, but uh, I was it's, thinking more about one of their parties. There. I was thinking and have, more about have the one group of their... get together outside. Yeah. yeah. Well, now it's it's also getting cold to have, have outdoor meetings mm -hmm. between now and April. So um, we'd need some place where we could meet with some level of heating. But we keep on coming around to the community facilities like libraries. Um, but that's not in conjunction with an event. Your, your point is tie it into something where members are coming anyway. 
and make it a make it a a, a double up. Uh, I think we probably could get use of the education building at um, Sweet Run, but that's not convenient. I mean, that's that's any of the dark sky places are uh, an hour away for just about everybody, so that that's difficult. Uh, but Bill, if you can think about and and others too, if you can think about the the key topics that might intrigue members and get them to come in to talk or or how we could sell it how you know what's what's the pitch we could make that would make it interesting for people to come and not be intimidated that think it's for experts well, I think part of the problem with the eclipse is that we're not going to have this um, eclipse here. But just think it's for, what's that? Well, we're not going to have the, the full eclipse here in this area. And I think that's, that's part of the problem that people are, I mean, there are diehards like some of us that will travel, but <laughs> most people are not going to do yeah. that. And so they're not really sure what they're going to see. And so their level of interest is kind of tied to that. And if they're, if they were going to see the whole thing, I think we'd have got the people that want to get together and talk about it. But I think people are just, they're not aware of what we're going to see because we know it's going to be partial and it's just really not being broadcast in this area as a giant event. So. Yeah. And occasionally, yeah. occasionally I still see emails and they go to the, the listserv where um, people are writing in now saying, gee, I understand there's going to be an eclipse. Where can I get, where can I find a place to stay? Um, uh, along the center line and try to politely write back and say, Hey, you missed your chance. You're going to be an hour away now if you find anything and it's going to be overpriced. Um, and, um, you know, we do have, I, I think we have on the resource page on the research file, uh, resource file on the, on the Google drive, some suggestions about, what you could possibly do at this point. Um, and um, there's nothing great you can do. As uh, as Dan said about even even a place like Uvalde, I think Dan was saying a place like Uvalde, um, places on the center line are really hard to get at this point. And then there's the issue of how far away do you want to travel on the day of the eclipse? And... Um, and that can be off-putting to people. But we still want to be a resource for informing them what their considerations should be. Uh, Speaking of resources, you, you prompted a memory. Uh, I've been asked to give talks at a couple of local uh, photography clubs on uh, eclipse photography. So earlier today, I watched all of the Novak sessions we did in 2017 for the Eclipse 10. And... There is some great material uh, in the Novak YouTube channel in 2017 on seeing the mm -hmm. eclipse, the mechanics of the eclipse, eclipse photography. Uh, in particular, I'd forgotten how great Mike Reynolds was. I mean, he was the guy right. who was just a champ. Um, it's so sad that he passed away, but uh, th there are some fantastic resources for us to, to leverage. Yeah, and that's one of the observations is that a lot of the material which was prepared for 2017 is still fully relevant. Not much has changed. I mean, I, I, I made the comment on, on one of the pages that I bought the 2017 version of the ebook of, of um, Alan Dyer's ebook. And although he updated it or he's in the process of updating it, there's not much he can change except the time and place. Uh, but all the information about photography is exactly the same. Hey, you got to love Fred Espernach. He's he's sold the same book like forty times. You know, there were some earlier books that still talked about film. Those are obsolete. Um, I've been using uh, the Atlas. I don't have it right here in this room, but the Atlas for the twenty twenty three and twenty twenty four book, and I've been advising people on that. It's a nice book, not too big, ring binder, and it's got detailed maps of both paths, and that is really useful so and it'll still be useful i mean for 2024 so i you know my son was going to upstate new york and you know and it, you could advise anyone who's going anywhere near the 
totality path uh, with that. You can tell them how long they'll see it and so on. And I suppose they're programs, but it's just nice to have it printed on a page and just show some. So. Well, Jupier's um, online file, uh, direct, um, uh, interactive map, has all of that. Zoom in down to the street level and you click at any point until totality lasts. Um, and if you cross-reference it to, um, I, I don't remember the gentleman's name, but the guy who's got the weather data, then that's about all the planning information that exists uh, other than clicking on things and trying to figure out where the hotels are. But you go to Google and you can find out where the hotels are and, and, and the B&Bs and see what, what, what might be available. So, um, yeah, Pamela and I are set to be on the shore of Lake Erie because we didn't want to be too far away. Uh, and we've talked about various plans, but it looked like there might be a slight improvement for the, for the region in the Northeast along the South coast of Lake Erie. Um, other than that, if you want more than a 50% chance, clear skies, you've really got to be in Texas or Mexico. Uh, Mazatlan is the place to be. I assume that place is sold out. It's going to have like, I don't know, 20% chance of cloud cover or something. It's very good statistics. Okay. Well, it's. So, uh, Alan, I have two things real quick. Um, sure. Reference the, uh, you know, sharing this information with the membership, um, trying to get you know, information out there to people who are maybe intimidated and don't want to join us in the meeting. Um, we can share that. Uh, we can share the link to YouTube, the YouTube channel and just let people know it's very easy. All they have to do is search the channel Eclipse and everything that's related that's been recorded related to Eclipse will come up in a list and they can just sort through and they can see everything from 2017 all the way to 2023. Um, I can also broadcast a Facebook page. I've done that in the past, you know, letting people know because a lot of people don't really know that we have a YouTube channel um, or what's on it. So that's an easy thing to do to share information. Um, the other thing is, I've mentioned this in a previous meeting before. Uh, I will be in Texas um, in um, Copper's Cove, right outside of Colleen, which is um, on the center line um, for the next eclipse. My best friend lives there. Her mother lives there as well. And I did speak to her about her mother's property. Um, her mother is open to letting people on her on her property um, to stay as long as they're self-sufficient. So if you have like an RV or something, like she's not going to have like a bathroom for people. But if you have an RV or a setup where you have your own, you know, toilet, water, whatever, um, people will be able to do that. And I'll get more details before the next meeting on that. But um, she's got a couple of acres of property, not real close neighbors. Um, the nearest light pollution is Colleen, which is um, not sure exactly which direction it is. Um, I know I'm mad because I've seen it, but I haven't looked at it on a compass. Um, and it is it is quite bright. Um, the, uh, the Army base is quite bright, but it's a couple of miles away. Um, but other than that, it's wide open Texas country. And so um, that might be an option for people who are willing to rough it if they can't get anything else. Mm -hmm. Is that a relative? Yeah, think that was a relative, Candy. Yeah, it's my best friend and her mother. It's her mother's property, so yeah. Yeah, well, I I just through. I'll be calling you because we're. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Candy. I just suggest that. Um, <laughs> excuse me. That um, you you front end the uh, any any requests. Uh, yeah. Don't don't put the don't put the GPS latitude and longitude yeah, out no, there because be uh, yeah. uh, yeah. people will, will invite themselves and yeah uh, and they want to they'll want to know where they can shoot their own jackalope uh, right <laughs> Candy for uh, question for you yeah. um, I'm actually going to Killeen also oh. so it sounds like there are at least three people who are going to be in that area from <laughs> Novak, does it make any sense to have some or request some area where we could be together? I mean, I've got a, hot, a hotel rooms, but within driving distance, if it's if it's local and, you know, I don't know exactly where I want to set anything up. If there's one place 
right around there than anyone in the area uh, from from the from Novak uh, and who's staying there. People could be mutually supporting their activities. Yes, sir. Yeah. Does that make sense? Does that yeah. sound possible? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and maybe and Rich, you're you're reminding me one of the original motivations for having the SIG was to um well in the extreme to see if people wanted to arrange to travel together. That that wasn't of interest. But at this point we could start identifying where people are going mm -hmm. uh more specifically. I asked that in the last survey to get a general idea people were headed but uh, if there's any kind of consummational for people to say uh, i've decided to go to this place or that place <laughs> and we can connect up if it's if it's appropriate or we can look for especially if if people will be observing someplace different from where they're staying try to hook up on an observing area that they can meet up at on eclipse day or day before. Yeah. Yeah. That's that that would be something to do. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Candy. And um yeah, we can we can spread the word. Well and and you can decide how broadly you want to spread the word. Yeah. On, um, I'm gonna wait till I get some more details from her. I just want to make sure that she's she's if she has a certain number limit in mind or, you know, any other restrictions or whatever before I broadcast it. But yeah, it's, it's been mentioned to her and she's, she seems very open to it. So just want to get the details straight first. Yeah. And you might also want to basically set a cutoff on uh, how close to April 8th. Yeah. You want to start because you'll have other, you'll if you're traveling, you'll have other things to worry about. And, uh, you know, people will be calling you <laughs> the day before. Right. Uh, this is beginning one of the to software, sound like Woodstock South. <laughs> yeah, well, one, of the, one, of the, uh, one of the software guys, um, the guys who pre prepares Eclipse software, was saying, don't call me the week before the Eclipse. I'm not going to talk to you. Uh, <laughs> especially for the people who take the free version. <laughs> okay. Good thoughts. Anybody have anything else to uh, to suggest? I appreciate the, the volunteered ideas. That, that makes it more worthwhile. Well, thanks, everybody, for sticking through. We're a little bit late. I appreciate all the presenters and uh, all the good photography. I'm glad so many people got pictures they're happy with. So um, see what the uh, maybe see you at the Novak meeting. Uh, in a couple of Sundays, and if not, uh, we'll see you in December for another SIG meeting. So have a good night. It's clear out there, nearly full moon, nice and bright. Good night.